afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, to the Institute for Government uh, for our first uh, public event of the year. I'm really glad to see a very diverse audience um, attracted by the eminence of our speaker. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating time um, for us to be kicking off our public events um, with, uh, obviously, um, matters European on the um, uh, agenda for some stage this year, um, as well as a, a fascinating party political uh, environment. Also, we had the spending announcements um, only a couple of months ago. Um, by the end of this month, we're going to have the uh, single departmental plans produced. Um, so there's a, a, an awful lot going on within um, government at present. Um, over the next three weeks at the Institute, we're going to have three Secretaries of State um, speaking. Um, in early February, we're going to have Liz Truss from DEFRA and then Michael Gove from Justice speaking. And in a sense, a connected theme um, of all the speeches will be um, them looking in this new environment, following the spending review, the restructuring of their departments, and um, in terms to meet the single departmental plans, and also in a context which we're going to address today of a, a really changed constitutional position. There's an awful lot going on in constitutional um, affairs at present, and that's why it's particularly a pleasure to welcome, or welcome back, I should say, since um, Oliver Lettin has been a, a frequent um, visitor to the Institute, I'm delighted to say, over the years I've been director, um, Oliver is Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, but also um, the Minister responsible for coordination of policy, and since the election that has meant the constitutional um, uh, agenda. Uh, and he's been looking at that under a, a whole range of constitutional measures around the Scotland Bill is now in the Lords, there's a draft Wales Bill, the proposals for Northern Ireland, um, there is um, the, this is really the purview of justice, the uh, looking at the Human Rights Act, um, within uh, the Cabinet Office, there is the, the initiatives on voter registration. Um, there are um, the Strathclyde proposals um, affecting the House of Lords. There was a very long debate there um, in the um, uh, Lords yesterday. There's one in the Commons today, and one of our um, uh, people in the audience has, has got to go and uh, reply to that debate later on on that. So there's a very wide range of, of issues. And so that's why I'm particularly delighted to welcome um, Oliver. His title is the changing constitutional map of England, and he's focusing very much on the English dimension because the whole series of proposals, the devolution deals done with a number of um, cities already, every week there seems to be a new deal. Often those deals are rather different, and, and one of the things we've been questioning at the Institute is what are the underlying principles, where is the direction going with the initiatives towards um, decentralization within England um, at the local level, because it's not just the deals with cities, but there's also mayors, there's the proposals we heard from the Chancellor before Christmas on business rates, greater fiscal independence. So looking at where all this fits together, the direction in which it's going, and that's why I'm particularly glad to welcome Oliver Letwin to talk. Thank you. Um, well, thank, thank you very much, Peter. Um, uh, uh, what Peter says about the uh, amount of constitutional change that's going on at the moment uh, is absolutely right, and indeed he's given very neatly the first part of what I was going to uh, say. Uh, so I shan't, I shan't recap all of those, except to say that there are even more things that he, he didn't mention, indeed, in the last few days. Um, Parliament, for the first time, went through the process, I was going to say voted, but we didn't, didn't actually in the end vote, on the basis of English votes for English laws, uh, perhaps more appropriately described as English vetoes over English laws. Um, uh, and uh, the only other thing which he do, didn't uh, mention, no doubt, because it's so obvious to all of us, that is that uh, all the constitutional uh, uh, reconfigurations that he described are against the background of a very uh, important set of uh, negotiations in, uh, in the European Union. Uh, and about our relationship with it and a referendum to come, and indeed follow from um, the, uh, the referendum which occurred in, uh, in Scotland uh, and, uh, and the very considerable shift in uh, Scottish politics. So there's a clear background of a large amount of, uh, of constitutional activity. Um, uh, incidentally, I don't think that um, we should uh, imagine that there is something particularly unusual about this. Uh, in the sense that 
um, actually the, uh, the British Constitution, which incidentally isn't written down anywhere, as everybody knows, um, has been evolving for a very, very long time indeed. Uh, and uh, I think it's one of the geniuses of our uh, nation that it's able to evolve and absorb and uh, uh, meet the mood of the times uh, in its constitutional arrangements in a way that uh, has given us, uh, uh, possible exception of Sweden, uh, I think the longest period of evolving, uh, gradually widening franchise for liberal democracy of any country on earth. And I think we sometimes forget just how remarkable a tale that is and just how extraordinarily beneficial for all of our fellow citizens and ourselves uh, that's been. So um, I think those who, who think that there's something entirely uh, surprising or unprecedented uh, about uh, constitutional evolution in, in Britain are simply not consulting the history books and, and, and should do so. Uh, and I think also, uh, finally on that front, I should say that uh, I think people in Britain are peculiarly um, endowed and have been over history with common sense about these things, and people work out ways of dealing with change uh, that, um, that actually end up by working really quite well. Um, it, it may not surprise you to know that I don't agree with absolutely everything that um, uh, uh, the uh, SNP believes. Um, but my own experience of uh, discussions, for example, with John Swinney, with whom I have various discussions about various matters, is that it's entirely possible to have a sensible, civilised, mutually respectful conversation and come to a sensible conclusion about practical uh, operational issues. And indeed, that's been our experience as we've gone through repeated uh, and sometimes very difficult uh, patches where we're sitting in COBRA meetings and there are issues in Scotland and issues in Wales and issues in England and we, uh, we involve the devolved administrations as a perfectly workmanlike uh, relationship. Um, so I'm hugely optimistic, actually, that all of the things which we're describing will continue to uh, exhibit this tendency of evolving in a way that keeps our stable liberal democracy stable and liberal and democratic, and that is the uh, abiding purpose of uh, our constitution. As Peter says, what I want to talk about today, actually, is uh, to do with England, um, uh, a, a, an area of the country in which the government in Westminster uh, is the government uh, for all purposes rather than just for those purposes which are reserved or not transferred or whatever. Uh, and I think there's been much more attention hitherto uh, paid to the uh, much <coughs> wider questions about uh, uh, Britain, Britain's relationship with the EU, Britain's uh, uh, relationship with international uh, conventions such as human rights, Britain's uh, internal constitutional arrangements vis-a-vis -vis the different nations uh, within the UK, than there has on the question of uh, England's own constitutional arrangements. Uh, and I think it's really important that we should attend to what has happened and is happening in England because I think it is of uh, real significance for the future. And I want to uh, uh, try to make an argument about what it is that I think is going on in this domain. Um, and I want to start actually somewhere which is not to do with uh, the Constitution specifically, but is to do with uh, how we're governed. Um, and um, I, I see at the back over there crept in uh, Lord Norton, who. Uh, has written uh, uh, about this, I think, very, uh, very lucidly a long time ago. He pointed out that one of the points about constitutions is that if they're working right, they enable governments to work better. And if they're working badly, a good sign of that is that the governments don't work very well. Now, if you think back some years, and I know that, mm, alas, I'm getting to the stage where most of the people in this room are younger than I am, but uh, looking around, there are quite a lot of the people who were alive long enough to remember this phase, uh, you'd be able to remember uh, ministers of the 1997 and following uh, Labour administrations, uh, including the then Prime Minister Tony Blair, talking quite frequently about the need to join up government. I don't know if you recall that phrase. I certainly recall hearing it on frequent occasions. I doubt he was the first Prime Minister to um, talk about that. 
and uh, we've certainly been talking about it since. And uh, I've certainly read all sorts of people that, in all sorts of uh, journals over time and heard people at all sorts of meetings talking about the need to join things up. And uh, uh, they're quite right. Uh, he was right, and they're right. Uh, one of the big issues about government is how do you join it up? Um, why is this a big issue about government? Well, because actually people don't come in fragments. Um, uh, um, uh, a person uh, comes as a whole. So they're not, um, there's, there's not a bit of a person floating out there that, uh, that is a pensioner and another bit of the person that is uh, uh, a patient and another bit of the person that is a pupil and so on. Uh, one person comes as a whole. But uh, government doesn't deal, uh, can't deal, with all aspects of a person at once. And so it divides into, in every country that I know of, it, uh, it divides into departments and agencies and the like. And each of these deals with a, a fragment of, from the point of view of any given one of the citizens, uh, the, the personality of that citizen. And uh, because people come whole, and governments come in parts, uh, it, it can very often be the case that if you don't watch out, um, uh, one bit of government is doing something which from the point of view of that person is not consistent with what another bit of the government is doing vis-a-vis -vis that person. And this is a universal experience across the world. There's nothing special about uh, these issues in Britain. Uh, and um, uh, I next want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, it wasn't just that people were talking about this uh, at the turn of the millennium. Uh, they were trying to do something about it. Um, there were all sorts of uh, committees um, set up to try to join up government. Now, I see around this room some very distinguished and senior civil servants who, because they're civil servants, I won't, or an ex-civil servants, I won't embarrass them by mentioning their names, but they will have sat at many committees. And um, uh, they will have seen just how effective committees are at joining up departments. Um, uh, and, um, uh, of course, at the level of making a specific decision, it is perfectly possible to get different departments to be represented in a committee and to talk through the decision in a sensible way and to uh, hear the uh, views taken by uh, the representatives of those departments from different perspectives and uh, at least under a a uh, chair who's uh, good at doing this, um, and actually our civil service is very good at facilitating this, uh, to arrive at a single decision that, uh, that uh, properly balances the views of many. And of course, this is a, you know, one of the joys, joys of operating in Britain is that we actually, um, I mean, I know it's unfashionable to say so, but actually our civil service is rather good, and uh, it's rather good at doing that sort of thing, and it's been doing it for a very long kind of while, uh, a very long while, and it, it, uh, it works okay. Of course, that's not really the same as joining things up in the sense that I was referring to or that people were complaining about uh, back at the turn of the millennium. Because for Mrs. Jones, who is a patient uh, and a pensioner, shall we say, and maybe also uh, having a housing problem, the fact that someone has made a decision in one of those domains that has paid some attention to the concerns in other domains doesn't mean that she gets a result that is coherent for her. Uh, and. Uh, and if you want an example of uh, where that is at its most acute and most significant for our society today, I think undoubtedly it's the case of the interaction of health and social care. Uh, anybody who is seriously concerned, as anybody who's concerned about <coughs> our country must be, with the uh, ability of this country to sustain the... Uh, NHS and to sustain our social care system and to deal with the problems that are generated by an aging population is bound to recognize that one of the great issues facing this country today is the increasing numbers of us, I'm heading in that direction myself, who are going to be uh, frail and elderly and who need uh, to be uh, cared for in one way or another. And if uh, those who are frail and elderly are cared for in a way which is genuinely joined up, and if investments are made in a sensible way 
in preventative measures that enable them to stay healthy and at home, the consequences for them and the consequences for uh, society as a whole uh, and the taxpayer uh, are incalculably large. Um, uh, the, uh, the appalling sequence of uh, something going wrong, a frail elderly person ending up in A&E, that person being admitted to emergency admission, being treated often brilliantly by the NHS, going back home, not being adequately supported, ending up having another problem or fall or whatever, going back into A&E, going back into emergency admission, and ending up going into residential care is not just a tragic sequence for a person and the family that uh, surrounds them in all too many cases, it's also a huge cost for the NHS and for social care and uh, uh, is one of the great questions of our age because of the increasing numbers of us who very splendidly from another point of view are living longer. Uh, and trying to knit together uh, the uh, vast complexities of uh, the healthcare system with the uh, very considerable complexities of the social care system in such a way uh, that uh, a frail elderly person receives coherent, effective, timely, preventative <coughs> care that prevents that sort of sequence is a very significant challenge. I hope that what I've just been saying is completely obvious to everybody and that I don't need to make any further argument for that. We now come to the question, how do you achieve that kind of joining up? You can't do that by having a committee, uh, that, uh, or just by having a committee, that uh, has uh, conversations. It's a very important thing to do to have conversations about that and to try to work out <coughs> mechanisms, but you can't join up Mrs. Smith's care uh, uh, in a particular street, in a particular town or city of our country, by having a committee meeting in Whitehall. That's, I take it evident to everyone in this room that that, that that does not compute. For the thing to be joined up, a large number of individuals who are engaged in very specific activities at the local level need to join up their activities in a sensible, coherent whole that addresses her concerns as a whole person. Um, in a way that makes sense for her and for the system as a whole. And uh, achieving that kind of cultural change, getting very, very large numbers of professionals uh, to be able not just to uh, use their very considerable individual mm -hmm. skills, but to join together in the way that they use those skills so as to achieve that kind of hugely desirable result for the particular person involved <coughs> is something that requires a great deal more than just uh, some committee in Whitehall. So how do you achieve it? Now this is where I rejoin the point I'm trying to make about the constitutional arrangements within Britain. Because if we apply the Norton test, we ask, is our constitution within England uh, such as to facilitate the bringing together of the people that are dealing with Mrs. Smith's case in a way that will benefit Mrs. Smith, uh, then I think you have to answer that question, if, certainly if you look back a few years, by saying that the structures of government in England were not well calculated to achieve that kind of joining up, and that is, I think, why uh, Tony Blair and others in... Uh, uh, the turn of the millennium speeches were complaining so much about their own government's inability to join things up. It wasn't because uh, people were stupid or people were ill-willed. It was because the structures of government made it extremely difficult to see how, at the operational level, you could actually get people into uh, the kind of uh, discussions <coughs> and activities that brought things together uh, for the particular uh, a person that the public services were trying to help. Uh, and uh, it's from that perspective, rather than from the perspective of any uh, ideological ambition or any dogma or any theory, that uh, we are fundamentally, and have been now for some time, 
fundamentally trying to uh, reorganize the relationship between the citizen and the state within England. Uh, and um, uh, this is uh, very much work in progress, and therefore it also uh, has many, many aspects. Um, and uh, many of us have been thinking about it one way or another for a very long time. Uh, my uh, colleague at the back, John Penrose, the Minister for Constitutional Reform, wrote uh, many years ago with uh, uh, Jeremy Hunt and others, there was a very powerful work about localization. Uh, there was a, a great deal of thinking about this in the, uh, uh, in the years succeeding the, the millennium, both within the Conservative Party and outside it. And uh, during the time that we found ourselves in uh, office, both in coalition and now uh, in a majority government, we have been pursuing uh, pretty steadily uh, an agenda to try to resolve these questions of the joining up of government and its services uh, in a different <coughs> way from the model of having a committee in Whitehall. Uh, and uh, the fundamental perception underlying our approach is that if you want to get all the people who are concerned with the care of Mrs. Smith or all the people who are trying to uh, organize things so that uh, it's less likely that there should be flooding in a particular village in North Dorset, or all the people who are trying to make sure that uh, a particular community is able to plan its future, its housing, its infrastructure so on in a sensible, rational way, uh, uh, or indeed all the people anywhere who are trying to do anything together in a joined up way, we're trying to get that uh, result, a good starting point, and this is our fundamental point, a good starting point is to transfer as far as possible the uh, levers uh, of power, the levers of being able to do things and make things happen, uh, to a point very, very close to the point where those people are themselves. Um, uh, there's been lots of jargon attached to this, but it, 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 the, the thought is, uh, is nevertheless expressed uh, in phrases like place-based and localized and uh, devolved and so on. Um, what it's about is trying to shift the scene of the action to a point at which the people who are having the discussion have all sorts of things you can't possibly have sitting miles away from the action and trying to deal with things that uh, concern 55 million fellow citizens. Um, if you are in a place, if you know that place, if you know many <coughs> of the people who are doing the things that you're trying to discuss, if you know the circumstances they face and the constraints that they operate under, if you know the tensions that surround these things and the difficulties that there are <coughs> in altering the situation, you are much more likely to be able to put together a coherent solution that will actually, in practice, deliver the kind of coherent government uh, or coherent public services that uh, I'm talking about. That is our fundamental perception. Um, of course, before I go on, I should, uh, I should note, uh, in case it's sort of troubling you at the back of your mind, that there will be all sorts of instances in which um, the background conditions set by the state centrally, in this case by parliament and by the government, uh, will have an effect on the ability of the locals to act. So I don't mean at all that once you have transferred uh, considerable power to a locality, uh, you uh, have uh, produced a magic solution that will avoid you having to think about whether the background circumstances you're creating for the nation as a whole will enable the people in that locality to pursue this agenda of joining things up effectively in the interests of their community. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, it's a lot easier to imagine uh, governments over many decades, which is what we have to think of in terms of constitutions, I think, setting good background conditions if they're not also trying to operate the foreground, the immediate, uh, uh, from remote control from a very long way away, but have instead allowed people at the scene of the action 
to make the kinds of decisions that enable them to do so in a coherent fashion. Um, the next point I want to make is that although our fundamental perception is that the locus of activity uh, being shifted is the, uh, the single biggest thing we can do to promote the chances of coherent action and joining things up sensibly, that's not the only reason for shifting the locus of activity. So there is something else here involved. Um, uh, and that is that uh, although we're all part of one country, and while we're at it, part of one globe, and although it's incredibly important that we think of ourselves in that way as uh, together being citizens of one uh, country and indeed citizens of one planet, and for all sorts of reasons we need to think in those terms, we are also, at any given time in our lives, uh, uh, located in a place, and we have a particular set of uh, um, uh, concerns and desires and uh, preferences, which are the preferences and desires and concerns of uh, the people of that place. Now, that isn't to say, of course, that any group of people in one place all have the same preferences and desires. Anybody who's been involved in politics as long as I have knows very well that uh, within a hamlet you can generate huge uh, opposition, perhaps in some ways more intense than you can get at any other level of activity. Uh, but nevertheless, even when uh, disputes rage within a village, if you can get the villagers to concentrate on what they agree about rather than what they disagree about, you would find that a very, very large proportion of them actually agree about a very, very great deal about how their place ought to be. Um, and uh, uh, it won't be the same as the views that will be taken in some other place about how that place ought to be. Um, I, I'm always, uh, if I can just uh, make a brief excursion, I'm always enormously impressed uh, and astonished by the uh, depth of historical attachment uh, in our country. Um, there, are, there are towns in Britain, and in England specifically, which were royalist in the Civil War, which is a long time ago. And there are towns which were uh, parliamentarian in the Civil War. And there are towns that were on the side of Monmouth's rebellion and towns that were not. And there are, if you go to those towns, there's no reason why somebody who didn't know about British history should conceivably think that there would be a particular cast of mind connected with those historical events still in the 21st century. But let me tell you, there are. Um, uh, it's still the case that uh, uh, particular um, attitudes and political parties uh, are to be found dominating in places where those political parties' connections can be traced all the way back to these ancient events. Now, why is that? Is that because, you know, if you grow up in a particular place that was royalist in the Civil War, you kind of, when you're born, somebody comes and uh, whispers things in your ear that, uh, you know, make you feel... Oh, of course it isn't. It's actually because, I think, I speculate, uh, the people who come to a place come to that place partly because the character of that place and the character of that place has been formed by the people that were last in it. And so actually what, it doesn't always happen, things change, but it, there is a tendency that a place will retain a character because the people who like that character are the people who come to that. Of course, we lived in a, if we lived in a totalitarian state where we moved people around as they used to in the old Soviet Union, it would be very different. But people in our country, thank goodness, can choose where to live to a very great extent and therefore these patterns subsist. So, uh, actually, the characters of different places are different. And when I say different places, I mean right down to the level of neighbourhoods. The characters of neighbourhoods within towns and cities vary with, from one another. Um, uh, and that's certainly true the length and breadth of our country and its different uh, appearances as rural and suburban and urban and so on. Um, and uh, so there's another reason, besides the question of joining up things, being easier at a local level for trying to get to the point where people run their own lives more. And that's because that allows them collectively to determine, express, and then make a reality of their own preferences about their own place, which while they will be various, are likely to uh, be different in some, once balanced out, 
from the preferences of another place equally treated. And let me give you an exact example of that. I think it's, it's one of the most striking things that happen in our country, but um, forgive me those from the press here, I've never seen anyone write about it. Uh, I, I don't expect that at the end of this anyone will write about it. I've never managed to interest anybody in it, but it's one of the most interesting phenomena in our country. Mm. Um, some years back, when we were trying to work out how, yeah, this was when we were in opposition, we were trying to work out how do you get to a position that is true in many other countries <coughs> in Europe, for example in France, the Netherlands, where local communities tend to welcome housing. Just think of that proposition. Local communities tend to welcome housing. In our country, the pattern had been for a very long while that housing is something which you could more or less rely on the locals not wanting to have in their locality and setting up metaphorical machine gun nests to repel. Uh, uh, housing was coming down upon them from outside, they thought, and they didn't like this happening to them, and they would... Everyone here must surely have had the sense, certainly any politician here will have the sense of people gathering, not on party political grounds, but just joining together to repel invaders. It's very destructive because we need many more houses in this country and uh, we need people to welcome those houses and not to uh, reject them. So we're asking ourselves a pretty profound question. How do you switch that culture? And um, uh, we, uh, we came to the conclusion that if you want to shift that culture, you almost certainly have to give the people of the locality the power to make a decision uh, about the character of the housing, the placing of the housing, the things that go with the housing and everything else associated with it, because then they become quite different people. They aren't thinking about how to form the campaign group or set up the machine gun nests. They switch their minds around and ask themselves the question, what do we and our children and our grandchildren need in this place? What is it sensible to do? What would it need to look like and feel like and be like to cohere with the character of the place as we want it to be? Let's get together and think about that. Now, when we, when we had those thoughts and we set out uh, um, a program to institute neighbourhood planning, uh, almost anybody that uh, said anything about it, there weren't very many people even noticed, uh, said it will never work, never happen, no one will take it on, uh, uh, people aren't capable of this, if people are capable of this they'll fall to quarrelling, it will lead to uh, everybody being nimbiest and stopping housing and so on and so forth. Fact, it isn't that way. Um, there are now, I can't remember the exact figure, but more than 1,500 uh, communities in our country that are mm -hmm. engaged in neighbourhood planning right the way from uh, inner city uh, areas to uh, the most rural villages. Uh, uh, I think the number of uh, inhabitants covered now by neighbourhood planning is greater than six million. I, I, I may even be uh, too small a figure because that's uh, a few months out of date. Um, uh, and a certain number of these, uh, I, I think at the last look, 60 or 70 of them have uh, completed. <coughs> And that's a long process, because you have to sit together and work out what it is you're trying to achieve. You have to understand the background conditions, exactly as I was describing, set by the law and by central government. You can't just say, I'm going to build uh, things in sites of special scientific interest or not do the number of houses that the local plan determines for this place, so you can do more. Uh, uh, you, you, uh, you can't disobey uh, building regulations and so on. But there are all sorts of background issues. You've got to sort all that out. Then you've got to sort out between the people in the neighbourhood what is something they think is reasonable, where it should be, how it should look, uh, and then uh, then you've got to go through the process of getting that approved as conforming with the law. And then, most important of all, you have to go to a referendum, a local referendum. What has been the experience of those plans that have come to fruition? Uh, I can't remember the exact figure, but um, I think in every referendum, if I remember correctly, there's been a, a, a positive vote of over 80%. It may even be over 85%. Uh, many, it's been 90, 95%. Uh, huge proportions of the neighbourhoods that have voted have come out to vote. Everyone said nobody would bother. Uh, it's just not true. Meetings, I've attended some of them myself in various parts of the country. 
uh, to discuss neighborhood <coughs> planning, engage the sentiments of the locals in a way that uh, uh, anybody who actually knows what, how important people think this is to their locality would have guessed, but which very many people in the past said would never happen. And of course, it also turns out that in almost every neighborhood, there are spirits uh, that are people that have, have the capacity to lead and to help and to, of course, we provide uh, some support uh, to help facilitate, but actually it's the locals, by and large, who uh, find their, their leaders and those leaders lead. And, um, and they end up with a solution which they approve of in a referendum. And now let me tell you a really astonishing fact, which is in every, every single case, at least when I last looked at the figures, uh, the, uh, the approved number of houses in the referendum has been greater than the number that they were compelled to produce by their, the relevant local plan. People, when they are given the power, make a rational decision about the evolution of their place and accept it and welcome it in a way that they never would if somebody told them from outside what to do which is exactly what happens in France and Netherlands and Germany, and that's why we thought it would work, and it does. So we now have three reasons on our hands for thinking that shifting the scene of action from uh, Westminster to locality is a powerful device for improving the relationship between uh, the state and the citizen. Uh, uh, there's, there's the fact that you can join things up in a coherent fashion. I think what Manchester is doing with health and social care, for example, is a very, very clear instance of that. Uh, there's the fact that you can much more easily adapt the strategies and services uh, and uh, decisions of the place to preference uh, of that place. And there's the fact that people, once they take the power in their hands, cease to regard government as a uh, thing from outside that's to be uh, feared or worried about or resisted or cynical about. Instead, act in a thoroughly grown-up way and begin to consider their own future uh, as active citizens. I, uh, I wrote some years ago about the neighbourly society. I can't think of anything you can do more effectively to generate the neighbourly society than to enable people to take the life of their community more into their own hands. Uh, now, I, I, don't, uh, I don't want to uh, tediously rehearse the uh, details of a whole series of measures that we've taken to try to engender this shift but just to, uh, to glance over the many, many things that are going on, uh, all of which tend in the same direction. They're not all the same thing. Uh, it's not a sort of uh, uh, a systematic uh, textbook exercise. It's something which we, in itself, we've designed to be flexible and responsive and heavily driven from the bottom up. We aren't telling people whether they have neighborhood plans. We've enabled them to have them, and then they decide whether they have them. We haven't told people whether they have mayors or combined authorities or uh, to uh, do deals with uh, Greg Clark. Uh, they decide whether they want to. Uh, so it is, it's unashamedly and intentionally flexible and uh, variable in its geometry, but it all tends in the same direction. Uh, the deals that Peter mentioned, the neighbourhood planning that I've talked about, the uh, increased ability of communities to do a whole series of things which they weren't able to do before for themselves, the handing over of the uh, finance of local government increasingly into the hands of local government so that money is raised locally and not, uh, not centrally, uh, and uh, so that uh, they have uh, powers of uh, universal powers of competence we instituted early in the last parliament, uh, a, a, an unrestricted field of activity, therefore, for local governments, uh, uh, constrained only by the law, just as you and I can't uh, murder or steal, so local governments can't do those things, but they can do anything that you and I can do. Whereas in the past, if they wanted to do something, they had to apply for permission, or they had to have a statute which gave them the vires, and there was a whole series of things which were, and I quote, ultra vires, no longer. 
Um, uh, there's alongside that uh, these uh, huge uh, uh, shifts of uh, things like health and social care down to the level where they can be done in a coherent way that, as I say, we're already observing in Manchester and we will see more of in other parts of the country. And of course, it goes alongside the <coughs> vanguards that Simon Stevens has been promoting and much else uh, besides. Uh, and, uh, and that goes alongside the uh, movement to the uh, uh, local economic partnerships, the LEPs, uh, which are really totally different in concept from the old regional development agencies. They are not an emanation of central government making decisions about a region. They are people from the locality making decisions about their priorities and connecting those with local government and local business. Um, uh, and, uh, and, of course, the neighbourhood planning that I uh, described is in the same mode. And the next point I want to make is that if you look at all of those different things, and you look at everything that so far happened, I think what is really exciting here is that is just the beginning. This is a process and not uh, a single action, nor even a set of actions that happen and stop. This is a process of gradually deepening the ability of people in England to take uh, power locally, to exercise it in a way that meets their preferences and can produce coherent results in the light of their circumstances so that they act in a certain way and feel about themselves in a certain way. And it's therefore not a constitutional shift which uh, somebody has dreamt up in uh, some uh, academic lecture room because it looks neat on a piece of paper. It's on the contrary a process that gradually empowers our communities, and thereby empowers our citizens. And uh, that, I think, is a, a phenomenally important shift, which will have incalculable consequences over decades, which we'll only really fully understand, I think, decades and decades from now. Um, uh, let me say just one last thing. I've mentioned the, what I think are the practical advantages of this uh, process. Uh, and I think they're very, very considerable. Uh, in some cases, like the case of health and social care, they are crucial to the sustaining of our most important public services. In other cases, they are very important indeed, uh, from a practical point of view. But actually, it goes beyond that. Um, there is also a question about how we feel about ourselves as human beings. And I draw your attention to a very, very interesting set of studies that were done in Switzerland uh, uh, some while ago. Uh, a set of Swiss uh, economists uh, set about in a very uh, efficient way, as you might expect in Switzerland, to investigate the question, what makes people happy? Nice, simple question. Richard Layard has been uh, thinking about for many years, well, they went about it in a very sort of systematic way. And uh, because they were economists and they were, uh, in some cases, econometricians, they did regression analyses. And they uh, tried to correlate all sorts of things with happiness. And so let me just tell you something very important, which if Richard Layard were here, he would tell you, and then you might believe it, but if you don't believe me, read his books, and you, then you might believe it. Uh, there's an amazing fact about happiness. One of the very few things which, um, if people tell you about, they're usually telling you the truth. Um, uh, Descartes once observed that um, in a quite different domain, the, there's a commodity which nobody seems to lack, which is wisdom, because he'd never heard anybody complaining of having too little of it. <laughs> uh, but that may not always be true. But in the case of happiness, if somebody tells you they're happy, that's a very, very good approximation to knowing they're happy. I don't mean literally day by day, but if an earnest investigator goes and asks them, by and large, it turns out to be true. And what Richard did was to investigate objective correlates of happiness, and it turned out when people were saying they were happy, pretty much on any objective correlate, it looked like they were happy, and if they said they were unhappy, pretty much on any objective correlate, they were unhappy. <coughs> so what these researchers who knew about that sort of stuff did was to ask people well, whether they were happy or not, and then look at all the other circumstances that lay behind and they looked at whether they, had, uh, whether they were rich or whether they were poor, 
whether they were uh, um, uh, in stable relationships or not, and all sorts of things that you and I would guess might be determinants of happiness. And indeed, uh, unsurprisingly, it turned out there were some correlations between almost everything and happiness. What was the thing they found was most correlated to happiness? This was a real surprise. Turned out, actually, it was to do with how far people were able to run their own lives. Now, I say that's a real surprise. It's a real surprise if you don't think very hard. And actually, when you do think very hard and somebody's mentioned this to you, it's blindingly obvious. Because if you don't apply it to humanity in general, but you actually think about your own life, think about what happens to you day by day, and what really gets you, what really gets you is when you can't do what you want to do. What, what, what gives those of us who, I suspect, of everybody in this room, incredibly privileged and lucky, uh, such a quality of life is not actually the fact that you know, we have more money than most of the people in the world and that uh, we have all sorts of other favourable circumstances, those are very <coughs> important things. It's actually that we probably, most of the people in this room, or maybe everyone in this room, is this incredible privilege to live a life in which broadly you wake up in the morning and you do things which, although there may be some bores on the way, broadly are things you want to do. This is, this is what makes us feel fulfilled and, uh, and happy. And uh, that's what they found. And they found that in cantons, where people had a greater degree, or felt that they had a greater degree of control over their own lives, they were, on average, happier than in cantons where they didn't, or did so less so. And so, in the end, what I'm describing is not just something which is instrumental in its purposes, not just that we're trying to achieve some good practical results about managing public services so that they are joined up. It's not just that we're trying to enable communities to decide better how they achieve their collective preferences, so that's also very important. It's not even just that we're trying to get to a point where people's uh, uh, attitude to government is that they have some power and therefore they can behave in a mature, sensible, rational way in determining their own future, though that's very important. It's also that I think this shift is likely to make people in Britain over the long haul happier. I think people will be more satisfied with their lives if they feel that they have more control over their lives in the place they live in, rather than thinking that somebody else, somewhere else, that they may occasionally be able to vote out of office, but otherwise they have no real connection with, and that has hundreds of thousands of people active all over the country in some incomprehensible way, is running their lives for them. So uh, the argument I'm making today is that there is a very profound series of constitutional shifts within England going on, that relatively few people have really noticed the importance <coughs> of this, that it is in fact very important, and that it's hugely beneficial, and that it's work in progress. And that if we pursue it in a uh, consistent fashion over a long period, we will probably make people in this country happier, which is in the end what uh, we're all in politics to try and do. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Oliver. That was absolutely fascinating. You, you set out a very interesting vision um, um, of you know, how uh, the English would be happier um, in, by controlling their own lives. Can I just explore it? And you also talked about the it being very much flexible variable geometry. What are the kind of, but nonetheless, you have to have machinery. So how, what are the principles underlying the, the, your, the relationship between the centre and doing the deals? Well, I think um, the principle is that we're trying to achieve the kind of shift that I was describing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, of course, there is an implicit principle, which is that uh, there is the law, and that it needs to, uh, the, the, once the power is shifted, in some respect, nevertheless, the people exercising it, just as before, need to obey the law. And from time to time, of course, we discover that there's something which people would like to do locally, uh, and I'm sure we'll discover more of this as we go along, and which, in principle, they have the power to do under the arrangements, but which they're somehow being balked from doing by administrative rules or by laws. And so the second uh, point about these deals is that Greg has been at pains to point out, and we have machinery inside government to try to enable this to happen, point out that we are willing to adjust within certain limits the administrative rules, and if and to the extent necessary, to contemplate even 
changing the law, to enlarge the scope of action. Now, of course, there are limits to that. Um, as I was mentioning, in the case of neighborhood planning, we are not about to allow people to uh, uh, put up a, uh, uh, a large installation in the middle of a site of special scientific mm. interest. Yeah. Yeah. There are things which are of national concern, like our ecology, which we wish to preserve. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, evidently, uh, if an uh, community takes over responsibility for delivery of a certain kind of service, it needs to answer to the concerns nationally about the standard of service. So it has to be inspected by the Care Quality Commission if it's a care setting and it has to, or a health setting. And it has to, uh, it has to be transparent about how, uh, you know, how well it's doing for the people that it's serving and, and therefore uh, be able to be held accountable by its population and so on. So there, are, there is a background of administrative rules and laws, of course. But within that, we're trying to be as flexible as possible so that we enlarge the scope of action. But to what extent will there still be national policies in areas? Because, you know, it's a variable. You're not saying every local authority or groups of authorities or, or, or whatever gets the same. So to what extent do we, are we talking about a kind of patchwork of national policy or minimum standards? Or, or, I mean, because that, the, 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 you, you could get, in a few years' time, a very complicated picture of, differ, of differential provision uh, where does the national standards come in that national provision? Well, there are three things I would say to that. This is obviously an issue that we often discuss. First thing is, and I, I, I know you are very sophisticated about these things, so you won't have done it, but don't delude yourself that national systems have single sets of outcomes yeah, across the country. Yeah. Uh, uh, when people talk about postcode lotteries, they're very mm. often talking about national services run nationally that don't end up by producing the same results in different yeah. places. Yeah. Um, so there's nothing new about the fact of difference. Um, uh, second, um, I think it is absolutely crucial that there be certain kinds of standards which are universal. As a matter of fact, I think it's essential that there be certain kinds of standards universal around the world. But in particular, in our country, there have to be certain kinds of standards that are universal. I suspect every one of us in this room would agree about 90% of them. Um, and they're incorporated in the law in one way or another. And of course, if the national mood changes, we change those. But, but you know, broadly, I think actually, we know what it is that, that we demand as a minimum. And it's important we should set that and that there should be regimes for inspecting whether it's being produced and for calling people to account if they're not. And so that, that's uh, the background to any of these things. That's true whichever way you provide services. Um, but then there's a third thing, and I think that's, that's a really important thing to say, which is that um, it's different to have uh, a single national objective in a particular domain, uh, and on the other hand, to have a single national view about how that objective is everywhere to be achieved. And I think it's been much too much of a tendency of British politics, I don't accuse any particular political party or politician of this, but just in general in our political discourse, much too much of a tendency to uh, imagine that those two can be elided. And that if you have an objective, which is a political objective that you put before the public and the, you garner support from the public for implementing your manifesto, order, that inevitably entails doing it this way everywhere. It's just not true. Uh, it may very well be that the same objective can better be realized differently in different places. And if I go back to my neighborhood planning example, actually, I think building more houses, which is our national objective, one of our overriding most important national objectives, so that more of our people can fulfill their dream of getting a home and as many possible buying their home, that's our national objective. How do you fulfill that in different places? I think you can fulfill it much better if it's differently fulfilled in different places. But there's also, I mean, you, you talk about um, the variation, but there seems to be a, a big distinction between devolution and decentralisation. Um, that Wales and Scotland have different policies on social, social care. Um, they have different policies on prescription charges. Manchester is not going to be allowed to vary on those. That's true that, that there are things which are decided at the national level. Um, but um, there's a continuum here, and what we're trying to do is to increase the scope for deciding things at more and more local level, 
um, or at, at a level which is more and more appropriate, sometimes larger, sometimes smaller in scale. Um, uh, and that, uh, uh, that's very much more subtle than um, what you're sort of gesturing towards, which is a sort of binary decision that either it's decided here or it's decided there. We're talking here about a continuum and a movement and a process. Uh, and I think it's important to be seen in that way and that as we gradually move forward, I think the, the degree of the scope of action, the degrees of freedom will probably be increased and people will accept those increases indeed come from the bottom up to demand them. What about if you're a local authority, particularly a, a, a rural one, say, say you're, you're uh, Dorset, where you're an MP, um, you look at the big cities, you look at the, some of the more urban, not, not just the Mets, which by and large, not entirely, but they made a lot, but even some of the more urban counties of the Midlands, say, which have been more recently doing, doing deals. And you wonder, what have we got to do to be able to agree uh, a deal with DCLG and the Treasury? I mean, that's why I say the principles come in. It's, it's sometimes it's, like you can, it's not clear externally what's got to be done, what criteria got to be fulfilled to do a deal. Well, that's the nature of deals. Mm. In, um, uh, and we're trying precisely not to have a sort of rule book that specifies because then you eliminate the very thing you're trying to get, which mm -hmm. is uh, uh, creativity from the bottom up. Uh, but actually, I mean, as it happens, um, uh, I think it's perfectly possible, uh, I'm sure it's perfectly possible under the current arrangements for counties like my own to find a way uh, of doing a deal. And indeed, discussions are underway. Um, and uh, I think uh, you know, very likely in the uh, not too distant future something will emerge. Um, and very interestingly, that discussion is now going on locally, I, mean, I say locally, across the county of Dorset, in a very uh, um, serious way, but also in a very uh, grown-up way. Um, there are strongly conflicting views about just how to do this, but they're being discussed in a sensible fashion. And that's because people know that it isn't I mean, I don't know whether you remember, but when there were previously top-down efforts to create regions or top-down mm. efforts to create unitaries, so there was warfare with the locals. Not so now. It isn't that people feel that something's being imposed on them. They know there is an opportunity. They know that they can fashion that opportunity. They know that they're going to have an interlocutor who will also have views, but they don't feel it's being imposed on them, so they talk about it sensibly amongst themselves, and eventually we will arrive at some Dorset-wide view of this, and then there will be some kind of deal, I suspect, with Greg. And if you go back, say, over 140 years, at every few decades, which would be more frequent than the last half century, there have been reorganisations of local government. Uh, as you say, nationally imposed ones, one of the big, big controversies in the 70s was what the late Peter Walker did, um, and then the controversies in periods you're, you know, you're more directly involved when you were number 10 and whatever, um, with um, unitaries and carrying on in that fashion. I mean, this seems a, 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 a t totally different way of doing it. You're going to get local authorities, right, they may be separately elected, but in practice, they're going to be operating so closely together. When, does it, when are you in practice achieving a change in the local authority map um, by this route, as opposed to the previous route of, of, of imposing it centrally? Well, we're, we're totally determined not to engage in central imposition. Uh, so the answer to your question is, if and when people are ready. Um, and I, I'm, after all, there have been examples of people who have begun to talk in those terms mm. already. I suspect there will be more, but um, uh, we're not forcing the pace. What about from a central point of view? Because there's a very interesting, how central government actually handles this very diverse uh, collection of um, combined authorities, some, some with elected mayors and so on and so forth. Um, doesn't that change the relationship and make it terribly complicated? We already see in education, where I, mean, I noticed an advert in the paper yesterday for a, a regional um, 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 commissioner, um, where the, the relationship is now bypassing in education quite a lot of local authorities because of what's happening with, with academies and so on and so forth. Don't, won't, won't, aren't you in danger of creating a terribly complicated um, series of relationships between the centre and local? Um. Well, I suspect if you talk to anybody who's uh, been a minister or senior official in whatever the uh, predecessors of the Department of Communities and Local Government are, uh, where uh, you would find that they all said that there was a terribly complicated mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's ever very simple. Uh, it's always complicated. 
and actually people are pretty good at dealing with that kind of complexity. Uh, it, in practice, what you're trying to do is to deal with a particular set of people about a particular set of issues, and as long as you know who those people are, and as long as you and they are sensible, you will be able to do a sensible thing. Mm -hmm. And if they're not furious with you because you haven't imposed things on them, and if they have a lot of power to make things be as they and their populations want, and you have a sort of mutually respectful relationship, actually the day-to-day -day <laughs> frictions decline, and although it may look more complicated on a piece of paper, in practice life gets easier. Just before opening it up, there's one final point, which is to look at the kind of broader picture, not just England, but the relationship between Scotland, Wales, to some extent, um, uh, Northern Ireland, and also an area we haven't mentioned, London, which obviously will not come up much more after May, and the new mayor. But that, um, and you mentioned that the, what's happening in England is the process. Um, will there ever be a settlement? Will we ever say, you know, lots of legislation is going through now. You, you, you and I referred at the beginning to various things happening. We're going to have the European referendum. We've got the Review of Human Rights Act. We've got all the territorial, if I might describe it as legislation. Will there be a sense in two or three years' time you will, you will say, this is what the new landscape looks like? Or will it be a constantly changing landscape? Well, uh, I don't know, Peter. Um, uh, I guess history is probably our best guide. And uh, I mean, uh, certainly uh, since the Romans left, which is a long time now, uh, it's been changing relatively regularly uh, and in an evolving way. Uh, some of the shifts have been very significant, some have been less significant, but there's been a constant change. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, I think what's really remarkable is that so far from that constant process of evolution and creativity at the constitutional level, creating instability, it has created in this country arguably the longest lived stable mm -hmm. liberal democracy in the world. That's a, that's a pretty remarkable statement to be able to make. Mm -hmm. There is no country that has a written constitution that can claim a longer period of political stability and evolving democracy than we can. So I don't think that, that we should fear evolution as long as it's respectful and uh, proceeds in a, a constitutionally legitimate way, starting where you are and moving to a different place by the norms and rules that have been established in the first place, and as long as it's governed ultimately by democratic will. I think under those circumstances, people will be grown up, as I say, and just get on <coughs> with making whatever it is that is this year's way of doing things work and finding where there are difficulties and then adjusting, and so there's a different pattern a few years hence. All right, let me open it up to some uh, questions. Um, uh, we'll take them in batches. Um, George, um, gentleman there, and gentleman right at the back. George Jones, LSE. Why did your speech not include uh, an aspect of devolution that's absolutely critical if we're to have responsible decision making? Could you just and that, that is that's the sorry. devolution of local taxation taxation that bears on local voters. I know you're devolving business rates, but that doesn't actually bear on local voters. But why has the government, as it were, put a ban on devolution of local taxation? Right. We'll, we'll, we'll group them together. Thanks, George. And gentlemen, right at the back. Yep. Uh, thank you. Hugh Lloyd. Um, uh, I might be the only other person that agrees with you that the neighbourhood planning and neighbourhood four are probably one of the most powerful things that you've done. Uh, what's interesting, though, is in a sense that's a strategic thing for a place. How do we want our place to look for the next 10 or 15 years? There isn't a mechanism necessarily to do the operational sort of parallel. And I wonder what your thoughts are on empowering and giving greater powers to town and parish councils that are at that sort of similar neighbourhood level because I certainly believe that if they had more and were able to make more decisions from district, county or in some cases urban councils than they do at the moment, that would add to the drive you're describing. Thank you. Hello. Um, Peter Howitt, Department of Health. Um, I had a couple of issues with your, with your thesis around the health and social care in that um, I mean, health, health and social care funding and responsibility has been devolved for a long time and places like Torbay have made it work by establishing the relationships and Manchester 
have are, are doing impressive stuff now because they've been doing relationship building since the 1980s. So I suppose I struggle a, 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 a bit. I, it doesn't feel like that there's more devolution going, going out there. In some ways, there's more coercion around integration with things like the Better Care Fund, um, the statement that we want more integration in the spending review. So it feels like there's been, rather than letting people free and they're magically integrating, actually we keep on having to push them, often acting against um, barriers like charging and different funding regimes which, which push the services apart. Um, my second question, I, I really like the neighbourhood planning example. My experience in health and social care is that the power is sitting, going from, say, suits in Whitehall to suits in town halls. I'm not seeing the people... If you, if you go into the streets in Manchester, do you find the people in Manchester saying, yes, I know what devolution's about, and it's going to transform um, my public services? Thank you. The three very interesting questions. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, let me start with George Henry's point first. Um, uh, I, I didn't <coughs> mention it because it's so well established now. I mean, the council tax... Um, isn't uh, uh, mandated. Uh, what is mandated is that if people want to raise it, they have to have, above a certain level, they have to have a referendum and obtain democratic legitimacy. Once they've done so, if they obtain the democratic mandate, they can raise it without any limit. Uh, and as the, uh, as a, uh, if you look over the past, you know, n years, what you'll see is a huge shift from central government grant dominated local finance to what by the end of this parliament will be very much a local uh, finance uh, dominated scene, uh, both the council tax and the uh, rates, both of which will be uh, for the councils to raise and they will uh, prosper according to their ability to uh, encourage business and raise revenue from business rates and their ability to persuade their local populations to fund the services that uh, they want to fund. So, so I, I, I didn't mention only by omission. It's not that, it's not that it's, it's in a different category. Um, uh, the, um, the point about powers for town and parish councils I very much agree with. Um, uh, one of the spin-offs of neighbourhood planning is that, which you mentioned, is that uh, in some areas where they're not parished, they are forming neighbourhood forums to carry on neighbourhood planning as the law permits. And I, we, we, we have uh, expended a considerable amount of effort to try to make it easier for those neighbourhood forums then to turn into parishes so that we increase the parishing of the country. Um, many urban areas don't have at the moment any parishes. I, I hope we are going to move towards a, a model where most of the country has parishes, including our, uh, our cities. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, I think there's huge scope for um, uh, moving the scene of action for various things, not just from central government to, if I can put it that way, traditional local government of uh, unitary county and uh, borough and district varieties, but uh, down to town and, and parish. And uh, if it gives you any cause for optimism, going back to a point that Peter was raising, in our own discussions in Dorset, and I understand that's happening in several other counties, rural counties where there are lots of parishes already. Uh, it's been pretty much common ground in the course of many discussions of other differences that if whatever we end up with as a sort of Dorset-wide solution, as well as taking more powers into that entity from central government, we should push more of what is currently going on at that level down to town and parish level. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that at the very, very most gritty operational level, um, very often that's the most sensible way to do things. And actually mentioning the word grit <coughs> is highly relevant here. i tell you the very interesting uh, fact that if you try to arrange things so that if there, uh, I don't know, I hope it's not going to get that cold, but if it gets very, very cold and there's lots of snow, I'm happy to tell you that this government, having learned the lesson some years back, has uh, obtained a huge amount of grit. We have vast stores of it around the country. If we tried to distribute all that grit centrally, it would totally fail. Why? Not least because, as a matter of fact, you wouldn't be able to get on the roads to distribute it. You need to be on those little lanes in rural areas and in the little streets in the estates and so on. 
uh, to know that they are currently being uh, blocked by snow and you need some grit right there to open them up so that anybody could get to you to deliver you any grit. So what you want to do is to have the grit pre-distributed, which is what is now the case in many cases, and then you need, guess what, a local or a group of locals, a community of locals who are ready to distribute it. In the case of my own uh, village in Dorset, it's done by uh, local farmers. We've uh, reinvigorated the farmers. So they get out the, uh, the uh, farm vehicles and they, they distribute the grit. And then the county gets on with clearing the main county roads and the uh, Highways England gets on with clearing the motorways and the trunk roads. Very sensible allocation of responsibilities. Um, uh, incidentally, such a sensible allocation of responsibilities used to go on for about three or four hundred years and then it got disrupted and now we're reinstalling it. Um, uh, and that's just a tiny little but terribly illustrative example, I think, of the extent to which if you do things at the right level, it is also miraculously significantly more efficient in delivering results very often than if you do them at the wrong level. Um, uh, I find this a very interesting questions about health and social care. Uh, um, I think it's absolutely true that where people have formed relationships, you mentioned Torbay, I might mention Greenwich, similar sort of pattern, uh, over a considerable period, the, uh, the GPs especially where they've got federated, uh, the directors of social care, the people who are planning uh, admissions and exits from hospital uh, in the uh, acute trust, the providers of community health services for step-down facilities and the district nurses and bringing those together and having the right people, having the right conversations, it has always been possible to produce a level of integration of health and social care in this country vastly in excess of what we see in most places. And uh, that will continue to be the case. Um, the question is, and it, 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 this connects with your second question too, the question is, what across the country will most engender those sorts of relationships to be developed? Well, I think what we've seen in Manchester is, yes, of course, uh, and hats off to people like Howard Bernstein who are inspirational leaders, but also, you're right, years of discussion. But actually now, the acceleration of all of that and a huge and pervasive enthusiasm, which I'm beginning to see also in some of the other cities that have done deals, um, uh, for uh, deepening those relationships and working together across what had been boundaries and solving problems like the different regimes that apply to uh, personal contributions for um, um, residential domiciliary care on the one side and free health care on the other and obviously want to preserve the free health care and we also uh, can't afford to pay for everyone in residential care so you know, there are differences here but actually People are enthusiastic about resolving even those tricky issues where they develop relationships. And they're developing relationships because they're in a joint enterprise and have been given power. So I'm not making the argument that just giving people power will suddenly do something they couldn't have done otherwise. I am making the argument that giving people power enables them to do things and encourages them to talk collectively and to act in a highly grown-up way about it. And that, I think, will start producing huge dividends. And I think uh, people uh, who are the recipients of those services will begin to notice that difference. And I think the way they'll begin to notice it, to answer your last point, is, is if I can use one word, responsiveness. Um, I, I spend a certain amount of my time dealing with the Military Covenant uh, Committee. Um, and one of the things I often hear from uh, veterans, members of the armed services, their families, is that if you are uh, somebody who's fought a war, which is a very astonishing human experience, and you ring somebody up to talk about a problem you've got, and this person has never been anywhere near a field of battle, has no idea how the armed services work, you feel you're having a conversation across a vast divide, and you just don't have enough time to explain and so you don't, you don't feel it's responsive. So we've tried to arrange things so that uh, there's a, in fact, we're just literally doing this now, so there's a, a, a single line that uh, every veteran can ring up where they can have a conversation with somebody who does understand those things because they have had a similar set of experiences. Incredibly important. You really feel that as a citizen. Similarly, if you're ringing somebody 
and you're trying to get some local thing, local to your house, done, and they have no idea where your house is, and they have no idea what the place you're living in looks like, and, and in fact, they might as well be on Mars, you don't feel it's responsive to you because you have to spend the whole time trying to say, no, you can't do that because there's a hill going up to my house, and anyway, you must know that, and they don't know. Whereas, if it's done at a right level, at a local level, at the, at the level at which it can be sensibly managed and understood by the person on the other end of the phone, you get a level of responsiveness that I think is hugely beneficial. So I suspect that's where, in the cases where we're not actually doing what we described before, devolving right down to the uh, neighbourhood level, people nevertheless will notice immediately, personally, a difference, as well as a difference in, the, I hope, the quality of their services. Well, we, we've um, virtually exhausted the time. Just one final thing, if I could. Um, you did a blog um, 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 it, a couple of months ago on five principles for getting things done in Whitehall, um, which I commend to everyone. It's a re very interesting uh, blog going through... It's you know, the only blog I've ever done. You ought, you ought, ought to be making it a habit. No. Um, no. Um, <coughs> I just want just one final question, um, particularly given the audience. Um, how widely do you think those principles are, are practised in Whitehall? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the perfect position as coordinator. Uh, well, let, let, let me say something which is um, helpful, which is uh, one of the very best things that uh, I think we've uh, done in the last few years is to have introduced a group called, uh, I think you're very well aware of, mm -hmm. called the Implementation Unit. Yeah. Very, very intelligent. We do a lot of work with them. Yeah. We do, yeah. and it's admirable. They're a very intelligent, very organized group of people. In fact, I think I came to address them in this very Indeed. building at yeah, yeah. And And they spend their time trying to strip away the jargon and the peripheries and the uh, mush and get back to the question, what is actually happening on the ground? What are you doing? That's what, the, what those five principles amount to, is trying to be clear about what you're trying to achieve and trying to be clear about what's happened and trying to be clear about what you need to do to make it better. And that's what they're doing. And I think they are spreading that culture in a way I only dare dream of at the beginning. At the start, th I think it was Francis Maud who said it might have the appearance of we're head office, we're here to help you. Mm -hmm. When the implementation unit went in, it's not like that at all now. I'm delighted to say department after department are creating their own implementation units. They're borrowing the people from the central implementation unit to do that. There is a, an increasing concern around Whitehall with this question, what is actually happening out there? Let's find out. Let's be clear about it. Let's do something about it. And I think I'm very, very optimistic that things are improving in that respect. Well, I'm sure it's been absolutely fascinating uh, hearing you talk about your, your vision for England um, and also what change and how that will work. Um, and it's a perfect way to um, start um, and what's going to be a very, very interesting year. And as you start to drive a process, a lot, a lot will be happening in this area. We are following it closely here. Um, as I mentioned, we're going two more Secretaries of State um, at the beginning of February, first Liz Truss, then Michael Gove at the beginning of February, and I look forward to seeing you many of you there. And if you could join me in thanking Oliver Letterman for coming here. Thank today. you.